There's an old Lenny Bruce story about the Lone Ranger, but I can't really tell you that story this morning in church. It's a little bit risque. So the question Mr. Bruce raises is important to us this morning. Some of you might already know what the Lone Ranger does. He rides into town, he saves the day, and then he disappears before anyone has a chance to thank him. Mr. Bruce explores why. Why doesn't he stick around long enough for the people to tell him or show them they're grateful? What's so difficult or even dangerous about receiving other people's gratitude, perhaps even their praise? Here's another way to think about that question. During this holiday season of gift exchanges, would you rather be the person shopping for or making gifts to give away, or the person waiting for and hoping for a few gifts that you will receive? If the people I talk to, and you're among them, are any indication, I'd have to say giving, paradoxical as it may seem, is easier than receiving. Several of you have told me things like, I can't believe my partner has lived with me for 15 years, or 25 years, or 45 years, and still thinks I'd want, you fill in the blank. <laughs> Striped socks, a spinning spice rack, sexy lingerie. And you've said things like, I don't really need anything anymore, so I'm not sure why we even continue to give each other gifts. And People never really give me what I want, so I just end up feeling unseen, or even worse, ungrateful. Sociologists tell us we very often offer what we hope to receive, or we buy under pressure when we're running out of time. Whatever motivates us, our preference to be the giver instead of the receiver is probably even stronger when we're talking about the invisible and intangible gifts we exchange and rely on to get through each and every day. I think most of you would agree with me, it's often easier to give support than to take it. Easier to reach out to care for someone else than to call the care team yourself. Easier to encourage someone else to share their troubles and their tears than to allow someone or even, God forbid, ask someone else to sit with us, to listen to us share our troubles and our tears. But even when we're talking about material things, I've noticed we prefer to give rather than to receive. I wonder if it's like this in any of your homes. I remember the year my husband, Rick, put two beautifully wrapped packages with my name on them under the tree. Beautiful boots and soft, colorful scarves danced merrily in my mind for weeks to the tunes of ever-present Christmas carols in the frosty air. Then, Christmas morning arrived. Rick watched with focused attention and great anticipation as I performed the ritual unwrapping. Then, had to endure the disappointment of my less than graceful response. I promise you, I tried to recover quickly and be grateful. Part of my date brain did remember that I'd been coveting my friend Katie's bread machine <laughs> and talking an awful lot about how we can make our own pizza at home and our own fresh French bread warm from the oven and whole wheat loaves and so much more if we only had our own bread machine. And another part of me remembered how often I had complained that I couldn't make a really good cheesecake, Rick's favorite because our electric mixer must have been made the year after the electric mixer was invented. <laughs> Nevertheless, another part and rather noisy and insistent part of my brain railed and rebelled at the sight and the thought of practical kitchen utensils as Christmas gifts. I knew, I knew the man I married never expected me to stay in the kitchen and cook, but still, really? Kitchen gadgets? Oh, those uncomfortable moments when we miss the mark. Ouch. And how do we learn? 
I learned I was pretty good at giving, but not very good at receiving. The more I thought about it, the more I recognized the importance of and the impediments to being a good receiver. First, let's talk about the importance of. Think about exchanges for a minute, exchanges of all kinds, of loaves of bread and love, of ink pens and inspiration, of friendship and faith, all depend not only on the baker, the maker or the giver, but also on the taker, the writer, the receiver. It takes a receiver to complete the transaction. Think of those football games many of us will be watching during the holiday season. It wouldn't be much of a game, would it, without a wide receiver, a person whose only goal, primary goal is to receive, to keep his eyes on the ball and position himself to catch it, to have empty hands dedicated and devoted to completing the pass. And it's not just football. Every teacher needs a student, every director a cast, every play an audience. Even God needs her own creation. We're here to see, acknowledge, and accept all these gifts of life. We're here to prepare and position ourselves to receive. But it's not always easy, is it? I don't know about you, but I haven't always been that person. I've learned the hard way, I've already told you, to open gifts carefully, even cautiously. Learned how to display all the signs of grateful receiving so I don't hurt, at least not intentionally, the ones who love and sometimes shop for me. But I'm still learning to risk receiving in a real way, a way that allows me to receive and believe the gentleness and the generosity without which my life wouldn't be possible at all. Which brings us to the impediments to receiving. Any of these sound familiar to you? I don't deserve it. I shouldn't need it. What if I come to expect it? I deserve something better. I can't face losing it. In Letty Bruce's routine, the Lone Ranger explains the reason he doesn't stick around is because if people thanked him, he'd get confused. He wouldn't know if he was fighting the bad guys just to be good or if he was doing it to get the thank yous. There's so many reasons to refuse receiving. I've already been given so much. I'll never be able to pay back what I owe. I've wasted so much of what I've already been given. So many reasons to stay closed off from others to not let them see our need to hide and give up on being seen, heard, and helped. It takes courage to receive. It demands vulnerability. A few weeks ago, a member of our congregation came to me with an idea. Kathy is a single mom with grown children who don't live in Tulsa anymore. Her mother died over the summer, and she's facing her first holiday season alone. I have an idea, Barbara, she said, standing in the doorway to my office just a month or so ago. I'd like to have, I think, I think I'd like to have a Christmas dinner in my home and invite people who don't have family to be with this year. Would you be willing to spread the word? Do you think there might be members of this congregation who would come? I'm still working on the answer to Kathy's question. I have two takers so far. I hope there'll be more. If anyone here this morning is interested, please feel free to talk to me after this morning's service. Whoever accepts this simple and ingenious invitation will be taking a risk. They'll have to be brave enough to be vulnerable, bold enough to take a chance on new friendships wise enough to know it's never too late to reconnect with community. Risky business, for sure, and not something we're often taught. Many of us are taught how to give, but few of us are taught the art of receiving. In fact, 
Most of us have been taught, and probably still teach our children, it's better to give than to receive. There's truth in those words, but the more I reflect on giving gifts, giving gifts and gratitude, the more I want us to teach our children about the other side of the equation, the receiving end. The monk's side of the story we heard in this morning's reading. We can't grow truly grateful or generous until we become conscious of all that we receive, of all that we depend upon. In this church, we teach our children to help those in need. As your minister organizing social justice outreach programs, I encourage us as we are able to feed the hungry, clothe the poor, and house the homeless. I'm proud that we're a church dedicated and devoted to making a difference in people's lives by giving again and again. And I want our children to be able to ask for help when they need it. How else will they create community wherever they find themselves? Surely this is the only way we will ever escape the shame and the blame many of us feel and experience when we need to depend on others for survival, whether it's family, friends, or government assistance. Giving depends on receiving. When we allow ourselves to receive, we relinquish a degree of control that makes us vulnerable, and so the risk is high. But as in all games, including life and love, high risks often mean high rewards as well. Which reminds me of a story which happened at Thanksgiving 23 years ago. A story which ended up in national news weeklies like Time and Newsweek in November 1989. Some of you may remember a headline like this one from the Chicago Tribune. <coughs> Arab given heart of slain Israeli. I heard the story not in the newspaper, which I found online this past week, but from my friend and fellow midwife, Brenda Traum. I met Brenda when we were both studying to be midwives. She was the oldest in our class and had dreamed of becoming a midwife for many, many years. She'd left her husband and her four children back on a kibbutz in Israel to spend a year in El Paso, Texas, with seven or so other women, two from Canada, one from Alaska, one from Iran. I was one of those lucky women. During long, sleepless nights, watching and monitoring women in labor, Brenda showed us pictures of her husband and her children and told us their names. She had very long, very red hair, so long she could sit on it. As laboring women paced the floor, in between blood pressure checks and back rubs, we aspiring midwives would brush and braid each other's hair. A couple of years after we had all finished our studies and moved back home, Brenda's husband Zev, a teacher, doing his reserve duty for the Israeli Defense Force, was shot in the head on patrol in the Gaza Strip. They rushed him to the hospital, where he received emergency medical attention. When all the heroic measures were done, Brenda was faced with a terrifying and terrible decision of whether or not to remove the respirator that was keeping him alive. She found herself with the power to decide her husband's, the father of her four children's fate. Knowing he wouldn't have wanted to be kept alive without any brain function, Brenda made the terrible decision to allow his life to end. But before doing so, after many consultations with many doctors, she approved multiple organ donations from his young and healthy body. Although transplants are counter to Orthodox Jewish law, Zev would have approved, she was sure. The hospital promised Brenda that no one's name would be released to the press. No one imagined or could ever have predicted what happened next. The hospital evaluated the lists of people waiting for transplants. Then they airlifted Zev's heart by helicopter to a hospital in Jerusalem, where Hannah Cotter, also a father of four, had been waiting for a life saving heart transplant. Mr. Cotter lived in the old 
walled city of Jerusalem along the Via Dolorosa and had suffered from a heart condition for many, many years. Mr. Cotter was an Arab. The doctors performed a successful operation. Brenda's anonymity promised to her by medical personnel was lost almost immediately. Friends and neighbors confronted and questioned her. Weren't there good Jews who deserved her husband's heart? In the press, even the head of the pediatrics department was quoted as saying the choice of an Arab recipient was tasteless and tactless. Many in the Palestinian community rejected the humanitarian act as well. Who needs help from a people who don't respect us, our human rights, or our traditions? They cried out. There were so many reasons, personal and political, not to accept this gift. Finally, Mr. Cotter's, the recipient's wife, spoke to a journalist, and a new article appeared in the press. She said she had no words to thank Brenda and her family. They had saved her husband's life, and she would never be able to thank them enough. She only hoped Brenda and her children knew that she and her children would be forever grateful. Even the literal gift of life can be difficult to receive, not only in the complicated context of the Middle East, but when we are called to live on, even as those around us and those we love are hurt or die. In the newspaper, the following day, Brenda's response appeared. When I heard Mr. Cotter's wife say she had no words to thank us, that we saved the life of her husband, the father of her children, I felt that all the risk to her family and to mine, all the risk was worth it. In the end, many Arabs who lived near the Traum family attended Zev's funeral service, and Brenda has told her friends that despite the judgments, the hatred, and the veiled threats of violence, she had no regrets. And no doubt she would agree to the donation again today, even, or maybe especially knowing it would save the life of an Arab. In a world in which almost everything is bought and sold, there is more power in a gift than ever before. Did you know a place in line for a lobbyist who wants to attend a congressional hearing in Washington, D.C. goes for $20 an hour? Or that a prison cell upgrade costs $82 a night? Or that the services of an Indian surrogate mother to carry a pregnancy cost $6,250. There's more power in a gift at this time than ever before in history. What we learn and what the market can bear interfere with our instinct, our God-given instinct to give and to receive, to see and be seen in our times of scarcity and in our times of abundance. Remember the Lone Ranger? Notice the adjective which describes our iconic cultural hero, the lone ranger. He is alone, isolated, too scared of being seen to get to know the people he protects and saves. He has a point. Real gifts aren't about money or markets at all. Meaningful gifts are really all about relationships. Once we accept a gift, we are bound together in a relationship with the giver. We risk being seen not as we see ourselves, but as the other sees us. It doesn't matter if the gift is wrapped and put under the tree by someone who loves and cares for you, if it's the beauty of the natural world, the gift of sexual intimacy, or of platonic friendship. It doesn't matter what you attribute the source of these gifts to be. Mother Nature, God, great mystery or great spirit. To receive and to give binds us together. So it does matter that we acknowledge the gifts we receive each and every day and that we dare to open them. Because if you empty your hands, focus on what's coming your way, then catch the ball and run with it without looking back or worrying about what's next, you may find yourself playing 
a whole new game. More like a kind of a dance, a dance of thanksgiving and receiving that anyone can do at any age. Sometimes you get to give, sometimes it's your, your turn to receive, sometimes you lead, sometimes you follow. It's fulfilling. You might even come to believe that your purpose here on earth is to find a way to do this dance to as many kinds of music in as many different situations as you can imagine. There's a six-year-old boy who happens to be a member of this congregation who's learning about the possibility of this kind of purpose. A few weeks ago, I received a check in the mail from John. The note I received with the check explained that John was sending me the money he had received for his birthday to support the efforts of our own All Souls Community Resource Bank. It was hard to do, he explained, but he finally agreed that his mom and dad were probably right. And he didn't need a whole lot of new toys this year since he had nearly everything he wanted already. And he was really worried there were kids his age who didn't have enough food to eat when they went home from school at night. He knew his family had enough to eat, and he was grateful for that. It was hard to imagine other kids didn't have enough, but he believed his mom. I hope my money makes a difference for a kid I don't know, he told his parents. We're about to enter the season of gift receiving. Yes, it is also the season of gift giving, but I want you to focus today or maybe all week, or even all month, if you can stand it, on your capacity to receive. It would make my husband happy to know the lesson I learned that Christmas many years ago will encourage someone here to not only stop and consider why your loved one may choose to give you a you fill in the blank pair of fuzzy slippers this year, but also to stop and risk receiving the gifts in your life right now. To slow down and consider how nature's abundance or God's abundant life is real in your life right now. If you would only take the risk and receive it. So I challenge you this holiday season to look around and, what can, and remember what gifts you've left unrecognized and unopened under some long ago forgotten fir tree in a hidden bottom drawer or in some still unspoken dream? What gifts are just waiting to be opened? What's keeping you from opening them? What would it take for you to dare to open just one of those gifts this very day? If you need, someone to help you find it underneath all your piled up excuses for why you don't deserve it. I'm sure I can find someone to help you look for it. If you need someone to help you unwrap it because you just don't have the strength, I'm sure you'll find a strong and willing helper here among us. If you need someone to help you figure out what you'll owe in return, forget about it. And remember, you're already giving back when you accept the gift. Just don't let any of those reasons stop you from being a receiver this season. If gifts are to be life-giving, gifts of the heart, gifts of nature, gifts from God, they need to be received. It's only when we risk receiving love that we come to know in our bones we actually do deserve it. As far as I know, Zev Traun's heart still beats in the chest of Hannah Kader today. If we won't risk it together, who will?